Good morning and thank you for joining us for another Rebellion Online Sunday. Okay, we're a few weeks into this, so let me give you some insights. One, uh, today it's actually Wednesday morning. It's not Sunday morning or whatever day you might be watching this on. It's Wednesday morning. So the way this works is during the week, the pastors all get together and we film. We film our intros and the communion and we film the worship and we film the teachings. And then for the rest of the week, we try to do that as early in the week as we can. For the rest of the week, really smart people like Brandon Savage and Garrett and Josiah Scott Borg spend a lot of time doing the editing and making it look and sound awesome. So uh, another aspect to this is this is really weird for like Bill Sherman and I. Bill Sherman is our lead pastor. He teaches downstairs. I'm the youth pastor. I teach upstairs. Normally, when we're doing our teaching type thing, we don't have to see or hear ourselves. So it's really weird. Like to do this on a Wednesday, which is okay. I'm looking at the camera and I'm doing my thing. But then what happens is on Sunday, you know, I have to turn it on and I'm interacting with you guys on Facebook or on uh, YouTube while I'm standing there doing my thing. And that's really weird. I am going to be super happy when this is all over, just like you guys will be. Can't wait to have the upper room filled with middle school and high school students again to see your happy faces. You know who else is going to be excited to see you? My beautiful wife, Elena. So, quick update on the Alt family. My wife, Elena, she leads the worship for the youth group. She's in charge of that type of thing. If you have any thoughts, questions, comments, send them her way. Uh, she's doing great. She's the head of the math department at Damani. She teaches at Damani. She has set up shop in our dining room where uh, she's, she's conducting classes and tutoring and meetings from like 7.45 to about 4 o'clock each day. But it's kind of nice because she gets breaks that she didn't get before and she's playing with the puppies, more on them in a minute, and going into the garden and things like that. My daughter, Annalise, who's one of our high school uh, rebellion leaders, She's 20, she's at home, she's thriving, straight up thriving. She's an introvert, she loves this. She's playing with the dogs, she's helping out with youth group stuff. Uh, she's in touch with a lot of you guys. She's done some redecorating. She's always in the kitchen coming up with new, cool, fun things. Always trying out something fun and new for us. My son Aiden is a senior Damani. Doing pretty good, he's doing pretty good. He's really sad to be missing his senior year and I think a lot of you are feeling the same way, whether you're a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, middle school, you are actually missing school. He misses school. I hope you guys are able to go back in May. I hope my son and you other seniors get your senior sunset. But he's doing well. He's doing well. He's getting a shift or two at Yogurt Beach a week. And he's got a, his cousin is his best friend and they hang out a little bit. So, you know, Aiden's doing pretty well. I said I would talk about the puppies. So here's a shot of our puppies. You know, I love these guys. They have made quarantine life way better. And uh, before I talk a little bit more about them, you know, next week, we're going to be dropping some more updates from other leaders. I just gave you a quick update on the Alt family. So other leaders are going to be doing 60 second updates on how they are. You guys, they miss you. Can I just say that? The leaders really miss seeing you. I hope you feel the same way. So in an effort to keep our, everyone as connected as possible, Leaders are going to be dropping just like 60 second updates. You're going to see and hear from Matt and Janie and Josie and Josiah and Garrett and Evan and all the rest of the leaders um, next week. Or actually, it'll be this week now since this is Sunday morning. Back to the puppies, though. So, we love our boxers. And one of the great things about home, being at home and watching streaming church is that you get to have your pets right there with you. So, as I'm doing this, I'm at Hope, but on Sunday morning, my wife, and my kids will be watching this at home. And the dogs are going to be right there. So this is Take Your Pet to Church Day. We called for it last week. And we got some great video submissions of you guys with your pets. So let's take a look at what we got real quick.
fantastic. You guys have some of the best pets. I was I was really happy to see a couple of horse shots in there. The horse shots were really surprising. So it is Take Your Pet to Church Day. I hope you guys have your pet right there and you're having a great time with them. So as I think about quarantine life, I said earlier I would talk about the puppies a little bit. They have been a blessing. I can't call them, I shouldn't call them puppies anymore. Duke and India are over a year old now. But they have been a really great blessing. And if you have a pet, you know, I think you probably will agree. They've been a blessing during this quarantine thing. This quarantine thing has been a real challenge. Not just to schooling and interpersonal relationships and all that, but when I think about it spiritually, it has been a big challenge to us spiritually too. There's a couple of different ways that I think it's been a challenge to us uh, spiritually. The first one is that we're all separated. When I think about the history of the church, I see the fact that even in times of great peril and risk, Christ followers, the church have gotten together. You know, you think about like the Roman times, they would meet in catacombs or out in fields in the middle of the night. Be, getting together was still important to them. Today, and there are there are parts in the uh, uh, parts of the world where being a Christ follower is downright illegal, and they still get together. The church gets together. Christ followers get together. So even at times of great risk and peril, the church has continued to meet and get together. We're not doing that. I think that separation is a challenge to all of us spiritually. We're doing our best to connect through Zoom and YouTube and Facebook and text and all that type of stuff. But there still is a challenge to us. I think another challenge is just outright boredom. We're all bored. I know a lot of you guys have to be bored. You've played at this point every game in the house. You've made every puzzle. You've gone for walks, you've gone for runs, you've cleaned, you've organized, you've painted, you've redecorated, you've done everything you could think of in that. You've played every app on the phone, uh, you've done everything you can think of, and you are just outright bored. I think normally when you think about our spiritual growth and development, you know, we're busy, we're working, we're going to school, we got band and plays and things like that, orchestra or whatever. Right now we don't have any of those things. I think normally we see a need for spiritual growth, we dynamics faith. But right now we don't see that need as much. And so I think the boredom is kind of stagnating our faith a lot of the time. And then the third thing I kind of notice when it comes to how the quarantine life is really impacting us is we're not asking questions. Right now, we're most everybody's just stuck at home most of the time. Normally, you guys are able to come to Hope on a Sunday, our life group on Wednesday night or Sunday night and everything we have set up is interactive you have the opportunity to ask questions if you are here with me right now as a Sunday morning any of you guys could raise your hand and we would stop and you could ask a question or make a point it's very interactive in that way right now you don't have that and so I think that is also stagnating a lot of people's spiritual growth and discernment so if you put this all together what I see is I see we have faith you think of faith as like a ball and then there's a fire and the faith is going into the fire and what's going to happen with it. So we're starting this new series, Faith Into the Fire. I hope you guys get excited about it. I'm super excited because we're going to be looking at the faith of some individuals from the Bible from a different perspective. Uh, one of the stories we're going to look at is we're going to look at this guy named Lazarus. Most of you know who he is or you heard his name, at least in a biblical context. He was a friend of Jesus's. And he, was, he died, and Jesus brought him back from the dead. That's a great story, right? Well, think about it from Lazarus's perspective. We're told that his friends and family sent for Jesus to come heal him when he got sick. So he gets sick, he's, on, he's in a sick bed, and then they send for Jesus. And he's like, all right, man, Jesus is going to come. He's going to heal me. He's going to come. And he's getting worse, and he's getting worse. And then you know what? He dies. Wait, what? Yeah, he dies. He straight up dies. Friends and family got to be like, whoa, Jesus let us down, man. What happened? We're going to look at that story from a very different perspective than we normally do. Uh, we got a couple of figures in the New Testament who went to prison for their faith, Peter and Paul. We're going to look at their story and how they must have felt when they are sent to prison for doing what they were doing, for being Christ followers. Uh, there's this great guy in the Old Testament. His name is Elisha. He was a very powerful prophet. We're going to look at Elisha because at the height of his power, his wife and says some things to him that he didn't like, and he goes into a funk. He gets stressed out. He kind of goes on the run, and he just he lays down and he wants to die. He literally just wants to die. We're going to look at that story. So we got some great stories we're going to look at, but we're going to start with an Old Testament one. 
We're in the book of Daniel. So if you have a Bible this morning, please uh, turn to the book of Daniel. And that's one of the great things. Like you can actually get up while I'm doing this and you go get your Bible. <laughs> I'll keep doing what I'm doing while you go fetch it. Uh, Daniel chapter 3. And while you get your Bible and you turn to Daniel chapter 3, I want to share a little bit of background. So this happens after King Solomon has died. King Solomon, one of the greatest kings in biblical history, he dies. The kingdom of Israel splits in half. Northern kingdom, southern kingdom. Northern kingdom of Israel, southern kingdom of Judah. And uh, within a couple hundred years, both kingdoms were conquered by the Babylonians. Now the Babylonians, they had an interesting way of conquering. What they would do is they would conquer you. And then they would let you keep your king as long as he agreed to pay like homage to the Babylonians. And as long as he agreed to pay taxes and send gifts. And as long as like he did what they wanted, he could stay king and they would stay their little country. But you had to send a tribute and you had to pay the taxes. And you also had to send hostages. Some of your best and brightest noble children. We're talking like adolescent age, pre-middle school, middle school, high school age sent from your conquered kingdom to Babylon, where they would be educated in the Babylonian ways. It would take a couple years, and then some would stay or be assigned to other places in the kingdom. The rest would go home. And what the idea is, they're bringing Babylon with them in Babylonian ways, and generation by generation, it would turn more into a Babylon than it was if they just came in and said, you all got to do things our way. It's actually a really smart way of doing things. So the book of Daniel talks about that. Because Israel had been conquered by the Babylonians. Daniel and three other guys were sent to Babylon. In chapter 1, you see them arrive. And one of the first conflicts they have is the food. Some of you guys are really, really happy about this. The hostages, and when I say hostages, they weren't in chains. They weren't kept in cells. They were of noble birth, usually. They were given freedom. They were being educated. They were given jobs. Uh, they just couldn't run away. But they had a lot of freedoms. They were given a lot of respect. So they show up in chapter 1, and, and there's a banquet. And, and there's food being served to these hostages who are from all around the Babylonian kingdom. The food was really good wine, because it tells us this was from the king's table. Really good wine and really good fatty meats. Now, I know a lot of you are like, fatty meats? That sounds disgusting. For thousands of years, the choicest cut of any meat product was that which had a lot of fat on it. Nowadays, we trim the fat off and we get rid of it a lot of the time. That was the choice cut back then. The king's table, all fatty cut slices. So these guys are just enjoying their wine and their fatty meat slices. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're like, mm, this does not look very good. Time out. Could we have water and some fruits and veggies? And the guards were like, wait, the servers are, you don't want, what? No. So there's this conversation that ensues where they explain, hey, look, give us 10 days. Let us eat what we want. Let the other ones eat what they want, the, the king's portion, and then we'll see who looks and feels better. They agree to it, and guess what? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they look and feel better than the other guys who were probably fat, drunk, and hungover. So God was glorified in this. Chapter 2, the king has a dream. They call on Daniel, who God has blessed and given the ability to interpret dreams, to interpret this dream. He interprets the dream correctly. He's blessed. Daniel's blessed by King Nebuchadnezzar. Not only that, God is glorified. Chapter 3, where we're headed now. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego face a very stern test. Now, I'm just going to read portions of this. Some of it's going to be on the screen. Um starting in chapter 3 with verse 8 is where I'm going to pick up. Some Chaldeans took the occasion to come forward and maliciously accused the Jews. There had been a statue created, and the statue was 90 feet tall of King Nebuchadnezzar. And the order had gone out. Everybody's got to worship the statue. Throughout the day, there's going to be times when gone, all these musical instruments are going to sound. When that happens, turn toward the statue and bow and worship. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego weren't doing that. So in verse 8, some Chaldeans who saw this as a political opportunity, they're like, let's go rat fink on those guys and see what kind of points it'll score for us. Skipping out to verse 12. There were some Jews you have appointed to manage the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men have ignored you, O king. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold statue you've set up. Verse 13. Then in a furious rage, King Nebuchadnezzar gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to these, and these men were brought before the king. 
So now they have to give an account of themselves. They refuse to, play, to pay obeisance to him, though. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, We don't need to give you an answer to the question. If the God we serve exists, then he can rescue us from a fiery, the, the, from the furnace of blazing fire. And he can rescue us in the power of you, O king. But even if he does not rescue us, we want you to know we will not serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you've set up. So they draw this line into the sand. We're not going to do it. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Skip down to verse 22. Since the king's command was so urgent and the furnace was now so extremely hot, the raging flames killed those men who carried Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into it. So they stoke up this furnace. Think of like a big half dome with like an open, uh, uh, an open part in the middle of it. And what these were like kilns. And what they would do is they would soak a fire inside of it and then they could bake like bricks or they could bake different uh, things in there. Not food like uh, ceramics and things like that. And then pull them out when, when the fire was smaller. They created a fire in there so vast that the men who throw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in there, just for getting that close to it, they died. So they threw them into it. In verse 24, the king Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in alarm though. He said to his advisors, didn't we just throw three men in there? Yes, of course, your majesty. Well, look, I see four men and they're not tied up walking and they're not tied up. They're walking around in the fire and they are unharmed. And the fourth looks like the son of a God, the son of gods. Verse 26, Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace of uh, the blazing fire. And he called out, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, you servants of the most high God, come out. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. When the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's advisors gathered around, they saw the fire had had no effect on the bodies of these men. Not a hair of their heads were singed. Their robes were unaffected, and there was no smell of fire on them. I know, like, think about Tahoe camp, you know. Just after being at the bonfire, you smell like bonfire for three days. These guys didn't smell like a fire, and they'd been in one. Verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar exclaimed, Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel and he rescued his servants who trusted in him. They violated the king's command and risked their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own. Therefore, he said, I issue a decree. Any one of any people, nation, language, who says anything offensive against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be torn limb from limb and his house made to a garbage dump. <laughs> That's pretty rough. For there is no other god who is able to, deli to deliver like this. The king then rewarded Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the province of Babylon. So, a couple things really jumped out at me about this story that I think we can all learn and will help us get through the quarantine life. And the first thing is that when you live a life of faith, you are going to be subject to conflict. So what I've seen as I've studied Christ followers, famous missionaries and pastors, just people through the, the history of the faith, they all have conflict. Conflict with governments, conflict with armies, conflict with non-believers, conflict with other believers. Conflict is always there. So when you live a life of faith, you're going to have to deal with conflict. But here's the great thing. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, they all had a resource available to them that the others didn't. They had God. See, when you live a life of faith, God is there with you in that life. And when conflict comes your way, which we have conflict right now, we got this quarantine life that we're living, God is there with you in it. So remember that this week. As you live your quarantine life and you have conflict, conflict with mom and dad, conflict with siblings, conflict with a teacher or an administrator of your online schooling stuff, God is there in the conflict with you. Let him be there for you the way he was with Daniel and the other three in chapter one. The way he was with Daniel in chapter 2. The way he was with the other three in chapter 3. The second thing that really jumps out at me about this story that I think we could all benefit from is that when you live a life of faith, you will stand apart. When you live a life of faith, you will stand apart. You know, look at chapter 1. Banquet night. First thing that they, they got to Babylon, they stole their stuff in their, in their rooms, and they're, they're, they go to this big banquet where all the other hostages are. And they're all of royal birth too. So they all kind of maybe know who each other are a little bit. There's probably music playing and it's la there's laughter and shouting and a lot of jokes being made. And it's a big party scene. And what do these three do? 
Instead of just fitting in, they stood apart. They refused to eat the food and the wine that was given to them. Instead, they wanted fruits, veggies, and water. I know when I think about a party, that's what I'm looking for. Fruits, veggies, and water. But it was the best thing for them. You look at chapter 2. God had blessed Daniel with this ability to interpret dreams. And so he put him in a position to be blessed by the king and to see God exalted. More on that later. Chapter 3. The three guys stood out because they didn't want to worship the 90-foot statue of Nebuchadnezzar. And so they got thrown into the fiery furnace. They stood apart. But in standing apart in each of these situations, they still had God with them as a resource. We should look different as Christ follows. When you live a life of faith, you should stand apart. And as you do so, you will be strengthened by God. God is going to strengthen us through this time of quarantine. And here's what I want you, the personal goal I want every one of us to set. Come out of this spiritually stronger than we went into it. I mean, you think about Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel. Guarantee you, they came out of this hostage time in Babylon stronger in their faith than when they went to Babylon in the first place. The third thing, the final thing I think we can all learn from this story, and that we can all help, they'll help all of us with our quarantine life is that from the obedience comes glory. From obedience comes glory for God. I kind of teased it. I kind of mentioned I would come back to it and talk more about it. God's glory comes from our obedience. So you look at chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. You've got these four guys who are obedient to God. They could have easily in chapter 1 chosen to eat the fatty meat and drink the wine and blend in. Chapter 2, you know, Daniel could have just came into the, the, the throne room and told the king whatever he wanted. He could have done that. Chapter 3, they could have easily, see, we love God with all our hearts, but you know what? We're just going to bow to the statue. No one will know. It's not going to be a big deal. In each case, they were obedient to God. God was glorified as a result. God can be glorified through this time of quarantine life. I know that sounds weird, but it's true. I mean, I think about Easter. I said last week, I want this to be the best Easter ever. And you know what? This was the best Easter I'd had in a long time. I've heard from a lot of you guys that Easter was actually really good this year. We were less busy. We were more focused on our family and on the true gift of Easter. What was done for us rather than what we do. We can come out of this quarantine thing stronger spiritually than we go into it. We just have to be obedient to God, you guys. All right, you guys, so before I finish up, I really want to share a story with you about a girl named Ashley. So I like to go to youth pastor conferences. I meet other youth pastors. I get a lot of great ideas and references and things from them. So I was at a conference, and I heard a youth pastor from Southern California, big church, tell the story about a girl named Ashley. Uh, she was a sixth grader. She came in, and before her sixth grade year, uh, she goes to camp. At camp, she makes the decision to become a Christ follower. After camp, her cabin group keeps meeting together. And she loved the time, the, the, the Bible studies, the prayer time, the fun things that her cabin group is doing. So, school starts. And she loves God. She loves her church. She loves her cabin group. So, she starts inviting people to come to church with her. Now, this was great. Her mom loved it. So, Wednesday nights, her mom's bringing a couple uh, people with her and Ashley to church for middle school group. By Christmas, the car was full which was awesome. Ashley kept inviting people to church. Now, at first, this annoyed mom. Mom had to figure out, well, how am I going to get these other girls to church? So she had to figure out rides, but that was okay. So now, sophomore year comes, and Ashley's inviting so many people that mom has to sell the car, trade it in for a minivan. So she's got a minivan now that she's filling with girls and boys from her middle school to church on Wednesday nights. Before eighth grade year, Ashley invited so many people to come to camp with her that there was literally a cabin just full of girls from her middle school at, the, at camp. Eighth grade starts. Ashley's inviting so many people to the middle school uh, that the minivan is full. So mom trades in the minivan for a 12-passenger van. You know, Ashley is a great way to look at quarantine life. Middle school is kind of like being stuck in quarantine. There's conflict. You don't want to stand out, and there's a lot of obedience involved. But Ashley turned these things all to her advantage. Yes, there was conflict.
But because she had God in her corner, he was a resource for her, middle school was a lot better for her. Yes, she stood out. You know how she stood out? Because she was loving. She was kind. She was patient. She was that girl who everybody knew, like, she goes to church. She's really serious about it. If you want that in your life too, go help her or go be with her. Talk to her. Be her friend. And so as a result, God was glorified through it. And that's the obedience. She was obedient to God. God was glorified. We see the same things in the Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego story. And I want this to be the same thing for each of us. Quarantine life shouldn't just be about surviving, just getting through it. No, let's thrive. Let's come out of this stronger than we went into it. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, their time in Babylon as hostages made them stronger spiritually than before they, had, they went. We can all come out of this stronger spiritually than we've got into it, you guys. And that's my prayer for you this week.